Seattle, and you get this major desertification. Where I was working, the climate was just like Spain, but the original climate would have been a bit like Cornwall, that sort of cool, wet, almost temperate rainforest. And you go to the little uh, cracks where you can't get, you know, sheep can't quite get to, and you have this amazing, kind of almost tropical looking forest. And then out on the plains, about five minutes walk away, it would be, you know, desert cacti growing. What happened was, as the Spanish came over, they, tran they transformed the countryside. So the native species couldn't really grow. And what would grow instead was, ironically, all the weed species that they introduced, things like chamomile and nettles, things that grow in relatively, relatively well in dry, dusty, Mediterranean conditions, happened to suddenly fit this new environment very well. And the native stuff didn't. So you've got your grandmother popping her cloves and not passing on their information. Then you don't get any of the plants, even if you had the knowledge, she should not have wrote them down in the book. All your plants disappear and are replaced with these new Spanish things, so you can't get to your drugstore effectively. Um, the next thing is cultural disenfranchisement. You know, the Spanish come and they basically say, your knowledge is a load of rubbish, ours is a lot better. In very few generations, you lose basically all the traditional knowledge that once existed. If you look at the few remaining plants that they still use that are native, the, the weed species that are relatively common that have managed to survive. And they use them for particularly unusual conditions. They use them for things like possession by mountain spirits and stuff like that. Not for headaches. So it's very few people use them and they use them for slightly unconventional beliefs. And then of course, like you lose a lot of your medicine with these. And then along comes this great new type of medicine that miraculously cures all these previously incurable diseases. So smallpox gets introduced to a population. Their own, their own traditional medicine can't treat smallpox, but this amazing Spanish stuff seems to miraculously treat this, this horrible new affliction that's killing everyone. So quite quickly, their old medicine is swapped, it's gotten rid of, and it's replaced with the new stuff. In the UK context, this sounds a little bit exotic and far-fetched, basically the same thing happened, a little bit less dramatically. You get the Industrial Revolution, all these young people move into cities, all the older generations go. In this new urban environment, there aren't any of these plants that they used to grow. It's quite difficult to get things like colt's foot, you know, traditionally used plant growing or alpine strawberries growing in an urban environment. And also, much much lesser degree, a lot of sort of people in the herbal fraternity complain about, or basically bang on a lot to, to my belief, about how Western medicine is really kind of it's a big conspiracy and we're all being suppressed. I don't really think that's in particular in the case of Ecuador, and the context of Ecuador, is really necessarily so much the case. And I think the other two factors are much more important. Um, and then finally, the other reason why I think that a lot of people don't use them, or uh, is that many simply just don't work. Has anyone seen this ad? <laughs> it's, uh, it's all the rage in London, if you're about there. It's got all the big billboards and stuff. And, uh, and basically gets me really, really annoyed, and uh, gets TV producers really, really excited. It's, Can we do stuff like that, James? I think that's great. Um, Okay, cheat death. It's uh, basically an advert for pomegranate juice. It's basically supposed to make you thinner and more beautiful and everything, uh, kill, cure cancer, uh, do every imaginative thing you could possibly imagine. Um, what's interesting is that uh, pomegranates do actually contain a reasonable amount of antioxidants, about the same amount as uh, red apples and red lettuce. Um, it's actually very, very low in comparison to things like oranges, black currants, particularly not exotic, exciting stuff. But the, the advert's taken the fact that it contains some antioxidants, about as much as lettuce, and is putting them up there. That retails for about four fifty, five quid for a small bottle of juice. Uh, it's fetishism, it's, I should have a label there. Yeah, there we are. Type, it's exaggerated claims of its fetishization. As we've got no history of taking a lot of these whole medicines, it's quite easy to dupe people into stuff because they've got no history to prove it against. So when I went to Ecuador, I told some lady in a market that she was telling me that probably something, and I said, oh, that's really interesting because in Europe, traditionally, it's used to, to get rid of mice. She says, no, I've got mice and I've got mint. They can't be possible. She's obviously using mint on a daily basis, and she's fine. I don't know, Ecuadorian mice doesn't work for, or it doesn't work for mice full stop. She's got an experience in using the product to say whether, whether what I'm saying is rubbish or not. In the UK, we don't have that experience to say whether something is quite easy to believe. Um, the other one, of course, are goji berries. Uh, I know they're a little bit out of fashion at the moment, but you know they were, in their day, the biggest, most exciting, most Jillian key thing you could possibly get your hands on. You know, they would do everything for you. Pretty much Botox in a, in a kind of wrinkly looking berry. Now, they, they always say that in, um, in Asia, they're really, really popular, they're really highly esteemed, they call them the miracle berry, the wonder berry. Yeah, they, they do, they, they do. You know, in Malaysia, they're really popular. 
as are raisins. They're considered like raisins are healthy and good for you and you know filled with good stuff and kind of healthy treats. But they're not sold for you know that much at one point was gonna sell for about 20 quid. Uh, that much basically being about this in real life. I think uh, 50 grams were selling for about nine quid in, uh, in Pan Organic. They're also, uh, incidentally, quite an invasive weed throughout much of um, the southern parts of the UK, places like West Sussex, completely overrun by it. Uh, it's actually quite, it's quite damaging because it could potentially harm crops like potatoes because they're from the same family. Um, meanwhile, it's probably growing in your supermarket car park and the people in there are spending nine grams of it. So I think this, more than anything else, is, is one of the key reasons why it's so easy for other people to dismiss herbal medicine. Not because it doesn't work, not because a lot of people don't use it, not because you know there simply haven't been enough trials. The claims are overstretched for what it is. This stuff is healthy for you, but it's not going to give you a facelift. It's good for you. That's all it's going to do. Um, uh, have pharmacolo pharmacologically active chemicals, um, and we probably take them every day. I, for a fact, have had three of those today: uh, onions, coffee, and chocolate. Um, and I have probably those almost every day, actually. And I don't have a controlled dose, uh, although they're pharmacologically active compounds. I don't find that uh, it's highly irresponsible or potentially dangerous for me to be taking them. Let me explain what they do to you. I don't think many people would be surprised to learn that coffee contains caffeine, which is a stimulant. Even the most kind of um, confirmed skeptic about plant-based medicine finds that quite difficult or quite easy to accept. I was, um, I was uh, walking down Portobello Road a few weeks ago drinking a can of Coke, and I was told off by some lady. I knew it was a BBC scam! You were just here drinking Coke! Do you not know what that is? <laughs> And I kind of thought, oh, hello. Um, <laughs> uh, Coke is probably one of the, well, Coke is Coca Cola, is probably one of the world's most popular herbal medicines, as is the other kind of Coke. Um, it basically <laughs> wakes you up and acts as a stimulant. Uh, the fact that it's very popular doesn't may, mean that it's not a herbal medicine, as is caffeine. If you're taking it as a stimulant, which I think a lot of people take coffee for, as opposed to a nice drink, it's not a nutritional substance, it's a drug. Uh, that's why I think the program ties or grow your own drugs when they just kind of mentioned to me. A lot of people think it's a little bit, um, uh, what's the word, kind of like uh, gimmickly attention grabbing. Whereas I think it's great because it's probably the most scientifically accurate title for the show. A lot of people would think, you know, growing your own herbal remedies is, is, has nothing to do with drugs. Whereas I would say that basically to lift the lid on what a drug actually means and to explain what it means. It's actually really useful, and all of these things can be considered drugs. It just depends on what you're taking them for. Um, everyone knows syrup of figs. What happens if you eat a whole pack of figs? Yes. <laughs> you know what's going to happen. What happens if you rub chilies? Okay, this is a kind of unusual type. But what happens if you rub chilies into your eyes, or you go to the loo, for example, after having chopped chilies? You know that they work. Out. All these people that you know, my housemates at university were very, very staunchly anti all this stuff. And I would say, you know, you've just knocked out six double espressos to crown your studying in. You quite clearly believe that caffeine is a stimulant, and you're taking it for short-term fatigue. So you're quite clearly self-medicating, although you don't know it. Uh, chilies are a decongestion. If you, um, they're not a decongestion in the traditional sense that normally when you have congestion, the blood vessels inside your nose are all swelled up and they kind of block it up rather than it being actually blocked with snot. However, if you uh, have ever had a really spicy curry, you'll know that your nose pretty much instantly starts to run. And it's because chilies contain a chemical called capsaicin, which thins mucus, making your nose run. If your congestion is due to a lot of mucus, which can be in certain conditions, basically helps clear them out. Um, onions are antiseptic. They contain a chemical called allicin. Well, they only really contain actually when they're chopped into or bitten into, um, and it's a response against predator attack. They basically, if they get a cut, they produce this, this allicin substance, which tastes horrible, so um, it tastes really pungent and oniony, sulfur-based, so insects don't, or animals don't continue to eat it. And it's also antibacterial, basically it's almost like an antibacterial scab that heals their cut. Now that substance will work just as well on the surface of the human skin as it will work in the onion. It'll kill bacteria wherever it is. Um, and the last thing is chocolate, uh, it's a psychoactive. Um, a lot of people might not believe that. Uh, if you ever heard people talking about themselves as chocoholics, or thought, oh, I just really need a bar of chocolate, I'm always eating a bar of chocolate. Um, it is 
it is genuinely considered a psychoactive substance and actually has quite a few different psychoactive ingredients all wrapped up in the same thing. Um, as does coffee, as does tea. Um, it contains stimulants, ca 